take a long 15 minutes. There you go. All right, hello everybody. My name is Henry, and today I'll be presenting my findings on an experiment that I conducted with my lab partner, Adin, over there. Thank you, Adin. Uh, during our experiment, we determined the angular um, dependency of the scattering rate of alpha particles through gold foil. Using this relation, we are, we are able to determine that Rutherford scattering presents uh, an accurate model for this, these scattering uh, effects. In doing so, we are able to extract some information about the actual nature of atoms and, and their atomic makeup. So to give a bit of background, I'm going to go through two different historical models of the atom and talk about the different th uh, experimental predictions that they uh, predict. So back in the early 19th century, people weren't too sure what made up an atom. They knew there were some electrons and some positive stuff going around somewhere, but other than that, they weren't too sure. Now, the predominant theory at the time was J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model, shown here. In this model, you have these negatively charged electrons that sort of float around in this soup of positive charge. I, I apologize for the plum pudding in the soup. If you're getting hungry from all these metaphors, there is food back there. Now, the, 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 the experimental predictions that we want to get out of this model is what it says about scattering. So if we take one of these atoms and we shoot it through a material made up of other atoms, what kind of scattering do we expect to see? And you can see in this model here, we don't really expect that much scattering. So the atom will go through, it might pass through a, you know, a slightly more negatively charged region here and move a bit that way, deflect a little bit that way, but you don't expect that much scattering overall. Doing out all the math, we see that this predicts small angle scattering that dies off exponentially um, as a function of angle. This dying off is controlled by this theta sub m called the mean multiple scattering rate. For gold, we predict this is about one. So Rutherford comes along and he looks at this and says, ah, I don't know about this. Let me try something else. This right here is the Rutherford model that he proposes. In this model, we have our negatively charged electrons but instead of this soup of positive charge, we have a densely packed nucleus in the middle. Now, because this nucleus is so dense and so tightly packed, it allows for much stronger interactions between atoms when it comes to scattering. For example, you can imagine if two atoms collided head on, the, the, the nuclei would interact and they'd just bounce straight off. So doing out all the math again, we see that this, large, this larger scattering angle dies off uh, as 1 over sine to the fourth of theta over 2. Now this predicts much higher rate at larger angles than this exponential fall off right here. A small point to clarify about this equation here is that this equation is derived assuming large angles. So for theta roughly larger than or equal to 10. This is not a limit of the Rutherford theory in and of itself. You can derive a Rutherford model for scattering for any angle, but it starts to get really gross at small angles. You can actually see this, this diverges for theta equals to zero, which is not good. So this equation right here is only valid for theta roughly greater than or equal to 10. So for the purposes of this experiment, we will restrict our viewing to theta greater than or equal to 10. And these two models give us two different predictions that we can compare against actual data. So we, exper we experimentally measure scattering rates at various angles, and by taking this data, we can fit it to both the predicted Rutherford and Thompson model and come to a conclusion about which one more accurately predicts our model. Now let's talk a bit about the apparatus that lets us do this. The first part of our apparatus is an alpha particle howitzer. This howitzer contains an americium-241 source which emits alpha particles, which are two protons and two neutrons, at approximately a constant energy. These alpha particles shoot out of the howitzer right here in a sort of concentrated beam directed out of the howitzer. These alpha particles hit a gold foil where something happens, we don't know yet, and it scatters off at an angle theta, which is then detected by our solid state detector. This detector registers the count as well as the energy of the incoming particle and sends it to an MCA to be analyzed. Now, there's a bit of a complication in the geometry of our setup. You see, what we want to measure is this angle theta here, our scattering rate. What we actually control and what we measure in our experiments is this angle phi, which is the angle of our howitzer relative to our detector. So at phi equals to zero, the howitzer points dead on at our detector. Now, in a sort of theoretical world where this solid state detector is infinitesimally small and our beam is also the, this infinitesimally point source, we would expect phi to correspond exactly to theta. 
So at phi equals to zero, the howitzer pointed dead on, we would expect any non-zero scattering to cause the particles to shoot off in a direction and not be detected by our detector. However, in practice, this is not actually the case. Our solid state detector is a few centimeters wide, and because of this, it allows for a range of angles theta that are detected given a certain howitzer angle. In addition, our beam has some width, which allows for further angles that can be detected given a certain howitzer angle phi. So this is a bunch of stuff going on. We got a, a lot of different things contributing to uncertainty, but we can account for this by essentially asking the simple question, all right, we have our howitzer at an angle phi. What is the probability of a detection that we see having, been, having come from a particle being scattered at an angle theta? Again, in this theoretical case where we have point sources and point detectors, this probability would just correspond to a delta function centered at phi. However, this is not practically the case, and from simple geometric considerations, which I can go into more detail later, we expect, as a first approximation, a sort of triangle-shaped distribution around phi. This is called the angular response function, and we determine it by removing the gold foil from our detector, so we just have our howitzer and our detector, and we see how deviations in our phi affect our counting rates. Now again, in, to reference back in this theoretical scenario with point charges or point sources and point detectors, we would expect to only see counts at phi equals to zero with our howitzer pointed dead on the detector. And as soon as we move it a little bit, the counts go away. However, this is not actually the case. And by measuring these deviations, we can determine our angular response function. So we move our howitzer around, we determine how our angle phi affects our counts, and we get something like this. This is fitted to a triangle distribution. Now, we can take a few things out of this. I see a, a fellow in the crowd laughing at my chi-squared. The chi-squared is not that good. This is because we, we acknowledge that a triangle is only a first approximation. We don't expect our data to actually perfectly model this triangle distribution. However, it simplifies our math greatly. So we use this triangle distribution and try to extract some data from this. The second thing that we can see from this is that this distribution is actually a bit off-center at theta equals to negative two. Now, normally we would expect the highest count rate when our howitzer is pointed dead on at our detector at theta equals to zero. This offset indicates that the protractor that we use to measure our angles is actually a, a little bit off, and pointing dead on actually corresponds to theta equals to two. Finally, this gives us our angular response function. If we replace zero with our howitzer angle phi, this gives us the spread around phi of scattering angles theta that we detect. We accommodate this in our equations via a convolution. Now, th this can intuitively be thought as taking these two rates, which are given Thomson and Rutherford, the probability of having a scattering at angle theta. We then multiply it by the probability of a scattering at angle theta being detected by our howitzer positioned at an angle phi and then we integrate over all theta. This gives us two different counting rates as a function of our howitzer angle phi, one for our Rutherford theory and one for our Thomson theory. This gives us two equations that we can use to compare our data given geometric considerations about our apparatus. So after that, we are finally ready to go. So we take our gold foil, we put it back in, we measure at different angles between phi equals to 10 degrees and 60 degrees. We let a detector de detect for a while, and over the period of time, at any one of our measuring rates, we get something that looks a bit like this. Now, this MCA bin number down here corresponds to the energy of the particles that we're detecting, and on the y-axis here is our count rate. Now, the first thing that you might think, and the first thing that we thought as well, is, well, this is about a Gaussian right here. That's our particle, and everything below that is just noise. However, as we found out, the energy loss through a, a material is actually described by a Landau distribution, which is a Gaussian but with a slightly longer tail on one side. What you see here is a Gaussian with a slightly longer tail on one side. So by fitting this to a Landau distribution, we, we fit this to a Landau distribution and get chi-squareds between 0.5 and 2, which indicates, which suggests that all this did actually come from a Landau distribution and all of these are valid scattering data points and not just noise. We further confirm this by measuring our noise, by taking our howitzer pointed away from our detector and just letting our detector collect. 
We ultimately determined that the noise within our energy range of interest is very small, much smaller than any count rate that we care about in our experiment. Therefore, because of this, and the fact that our energy, our distribution models a Landau distribution, which is what we expect, we conclude that we can use all of the points that we detect as valid scattering data points. But of course, it comes with some good old counting uncertainty. In addition, we have some uncertainty in our angles. We, we read the angles of our howitzer by eye from a little protractor that we have in our apparatus. But our eyes aren't so good, so we tack a plus or minus one degree uncertainty to angular measurements. My lab partner thinks 0.5, I think one, because I'm not as certain. So we take all these measurements, we divide by the amount of time that we collected to get a count rate, we graph this as a function of our angle that we measured it at, and fit this to a Rutherford and Thompson convolved fit. And we see something like this. And I, I think this really speaks for itself. This is, this is not an error in my code. This, Thompson is really just that bad <laughs> in accounting for our data. But we see here that the Rutherford scattering prediction more accurately describes the gradual fall off of our scattering rates as the howitzer angle gets bigger, as opposed to the Thompson fit with a chi-squared of 2,000. <laughs> uh, now, there are different ways of potentially giving Thompson a better shot, accommodating for it, maybe giving it a better chance of describing our data. And I can go into this in more detail later if people are interested. But ultimately, we see that Thompson is fundamentally unable to account for this data, whereas Rutherford describes it quite well. Now, there's an additional caveat to this chi-squared that we have here. So this chi-squared comes from fitting from our, uh, our Rutherford and Thompson data convolved with our beam profile. However, our beam profile does have some uncertainty associated in that fit that we had. There is some uncertainty in the triangle. So to sort of estimate how this uncertainty affects our data, we vary our beam profile within one standard deviation of its fit parameters and see how our goodness of fit changes. And we see here that the goodness of fit for our Rutherford model well, it varies somewhat depending on the convolution that we use, it doesn't, it, it doesn't change a significant amount. And it certainly doesn't change enough to warrant considering the Thompson model. The discrepancy between the chi-squares and sort of the visual discrepancy you see here very clearly suggests that Rutherford does a much better job of predicting our data than Thompson, which again suggests a more Rutherford um, makeup of the atom as opposed to the Thompson plum pudding model. So in conclusion, Thompson's plum pudding model is found to fundamentally be unable to describe the scattering rates that we observe at large angles. The Rutherford model more accurately predicts this gradual fall off, which suggests a more, Ruth more Rutherford-like view of our atom. Oh, and that's it. Thank you. Yes, I did. And this is a, another interesting point which shows that our convolution does benefit our data. It does a much better, not, not a much better, not as bad as Thompson, relatively speaking, but it does a noticeably better job at describing our data than the pure Rutherford scattering one over sine to the fourth fit. So the difference between 2.14? Sorry, 8.18 oh, is, is yeah. The, the, that, that's a chi-squared of eight for just fitting with the raw Rutherford scattering without the convolution. Yes? Um, do you have any plots that show your Mandel distribution fit the data? I, I thought I did. You, you, you saw me switch forward and then realized that it wasn't there, so I switched back. Um, no, uh, so I don't have a picture of the Landau fit. One thing that I can describe, which is um, a small caveat to this, is that the Landau distribution describes energy loss. Now, this is usually a Gaussian with one tail on, this isn't too well. It's a Gaussian with a slightly longer tail on the right-hand side. Now, this is a Gaussian with a slightly longer tail on the left-hand side. However, what we see here is energy. And energy loss is sort of the inverse of this. So we, we actually fit this to a reverse Landau distribution. And throughout all our data, we get chi-squares between, or reduced, reduced chi-squares between 0.5 and 2, which indicates good fit.
right. Yep, Sean. Oh, sorry. So what was the uh, largest angle you were able to get useful data from? Sorry? What was the largest angle you were able to get useful data from? Uh, 60 degrees. 60 degrees um, we collected over the course of five days. And I, I don't think we could have actually collected data at much higher angles than that because our noise data, our, our noise rate right here is 0. 0.0002. Now this is still a bit smaller than our counting rate for 60 degrees, but if we started to go further we would start to enter the regime where noise becomes m much more dominant. Do you happen to know how many total counts was that over? Five days? Or five days, off the top of my head, I believe 400. You can actually see, I, I know the rate here, which you can very easily go backwards <coughs> in the math. Oh, I guess so the rate this is somewhere down here. Like 100 counts per day. Uh, yeah, something like that. A couple counts per, per hour. Yes, something like that. Yeah. Yep. And our, our, the noise that we mentioned here is actually restricted to our energy of interest. So there, there's a fair bit of noise at much lower energy levels, <coughs> specifically between this MCA bin number of 0 and 50 down here. There's a fair bit of noise there, but once you start getting up to this larger area right here between 50 and 1500, we start to see much less noise. Other questions? All right, thanks, Henry, again.